I want to embark upon a journey through the Psalms. I want to invite you with me. I want to marvel, weep, and rejoice alongside you as a fellow sojourner through these stirring, sometimes confusing, ancient songs. The Psalms have been the backbone of spiritual life for millennia. From the songbook of temple-bound Jews in the days of the kings, to the prayer book of cell-bound monks in the desert, to the melodies of contemporary worship music, the Psalms have shaped the people of God. They not only shape the devotional life of believers, but they become a lens through which to see Christ. The Psalms are the most quoted scriptures in the New Testament. It shaped how Jesus' early followers saw him, saw his identity, his ministry, his character. Bonhoeffer even suggests in his little work on the Psalms, the prayer book of the Bible, that when we pray the Psalms, we pray with and through Jesus. We join Jesus in prayer through the Psalms. For anyone who has trekked through these 150 songs, you begin to notice some things. These prayers cover the gamut of human emotion. There are laments, wailing to God in pain or fear, asking for forgiveness and rescue. There are complaints, accusing God of sleeping or ignoring the plight of the wicked. There are pleas for vengeance, asking God to destroy the wicked and restore the righteous. There are also songs of praise, inviting all of creation to participate and proclaiming the character of God with joy. There are poems of wisdom reflecting on God's ways in the everyday lives of his followers. These prayers, as you see through the emotional roller coaster they are, are human. And interestingly enough, they are divine. God inspired these words. So what we encounter in the Psalms is a dialogue within the Godhead. God the Son who took on flesh, praying these prayers. This was Jesus' prayers. Gives full voice to the human condition. He knows where we've been from experience. God the Father who receives these prayers, inspired them in humanity. We're encountering a dialogue when we enter the Psalms. A dialogue through which God is teaching us how to pray how to commune with him through the ups and downs, and how to reckon with the world around us through the interior strength of prayer. The Psalms are works of poetry. Hebrew poetry, like English poetry, uses images to convey meaning, leading to what William Brown calls the theology of metaphor. God can be likened to a rock, a storm, a shepherd, even a bird. The psalmist can liken themselves to deer, weaned children, Lions, prey, wineskins. There is imagery of volcanoes, floods, warfare, ritual worship. There are even mixed metaphors, waterfalls turning into anointing oil. These metaphors build a composite, artistic picture that the psalmists use to bring their concerns, their very hearts, to God. Sometimes these pictures require some assistance, as life today looks a bit different. The material and thought world of the Old Testament is made up of instruments we're unfamiliar with, worship practices we don't use, the very real threat of military invasion, which is alien to many of us. It's a world of language and metaphors we must study, investigate, to grasp fully. Yet, much of the Psalms seem intuitive. It's as if we, with the psalmist, could say, I've been there. I felt that. So with the familiar in hand and a willingness to explore the unfamiliar, we can journey the landscape of the Psalms as wide-eyed adventurers ascending the heights of conversation with God with these as our guide. With all this in mind, let's look at the first Psalm in the Psalter, Psalm 1. Let me read from the NIV. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This opening psalm 
is a wisdom psalm, offering for its listeners two disparate ways of life. One leads to blessing, the other to destruction. The psalmist opens by separating these two ways of life through a progressive delineation. The blessed man is the one who doesn't do as the list progressively outlines. Walk, sit, stand. Do you see this progression? These verbal images help us to see the slow decay of the one who goes against the grain of God's character. Once you walk in step with the wicked, you stand in the way of sinners, and you recline as one of the mockers. Perhaps it is not simply a question of association with shady characters, but as the next line inserts, the question of one's delight. Where is your delight? For the blessed one, it is in God's instruction. This delight spills into meditation. The concept of meditation comes from uh, Jewish prayer practice. Uh, A commentator on this Hebrew word defines it uh, to read in an undertone. Uh, It's the muttering that accompanies meditative reading. Though the psalmist is speaking here of the Torah, traditionally referring to God's law and instruction in the first five books of the Bible, perhaps this kind of meditation is the kind we can do with all of Scripture, especially these psalms. At any rate, the day and night continual submersion into God's revealed word is what's in view here. When you delight in God, you want to surround yourself with his words, and there will be fruit. The next image is agrarian. Delight and meditation in God's word. It's like rooting into an endless stream of life-giving water. Trees by irrigation canals. Likely the image this particular Hebrew word for stream refers to are resilient. No matter the season, a tree planted by continuous supply of water, it bears fruit. It resists drought. The metaphor returns to the human as this one. His efforts will stand. He will prosper. Planting your roots into God's word makes one like this well-watered tree. It's an image of stability, growth, resiliency, and life. Not so the wicked. The psalmist jars the reader with contrast, reconsidering again the alternative way of life the blessed man avoids. They are like chaff, another simile from the world of plants. According to Easton's Bible Dictionary, this could be the refuse of winnowed corn or simply dried grass or hay. At any rate, this is the result of rootlessness. The wicked are affected by every wind, every dry spell, and are thus prone to entropy. Grasses in this region pop up with the rains, only to wither the same day under the sun. It is an image of flightiness, decay, fragility, and death. Therefore, the psalmist makes the case that the wicked will not stand. The way of the wicked is temporal, leading away from the source of life. The way of the righteous, however, the blessed way, leads to intimacy with God. There is no end in sight for those rooted in and delighted by God. However, the way of the wicked will come to an end. This opening psalm is an invitation to a lifestyle rooted in God's word through meditating day and night upon his instruction. Perhaps the editorial priest or whomever organized Psalms 1 through 150 put this psalm here for that express purpose, to plant, pun intended, an image in our consciousness, so to speak. A tree rooted in into life-giving sources, resilient and fruitful. I think that's what can happen when we meditate on the Psalms themselves. Let this image shape your approach to the Psalms. Let us root into God, the fount of life, and grow into rooted, centered, and fruitful people through a life of prayerful reflection.